Hey everyone, I'm Tamar Hussain, Managing Editor of GameSpot.com and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the Play For All Showcase, brought to you by GameSpot and The Mix. In this showcase, we're going to be highlighting developers that represent the bright future of video games, boosting awareness for games and teams that haven't had as much visibility as they deserve. More importantly, we're highlighting games and teams that encourage inclusivity, tolerance and togetherness at their core. All the games in this showcase are made by a diverse set of creators that have important stories to tell. These are all games that made us think, smile, get excited about, and feel good about what games have to offer. And we hope you feel the same way too. What is poppin' everyone? My name is Justin Woodward, co-founder of The Mix, the Media Indie Exchange, and the independent game development team in Terrabang Entertainment. You guys may not know, but The Mix and GameSpot have teamed up for over five years now during E3 to showcase some of the most interesting indie titles that have graced our screens, with interviews and trailers from developers from all over the world. This showcase is no exception. To the sentiment that Tamor expressed, our goal is to really shed light on some gems hidden or otherwise that you may not have had the honor of checking out. So with that, let's get started with some up and coming game trailers and hop into our first interview with Zalaver Nelson, who will dive into his new game, El Paso Elsewhere. Let's hit it. for drink round the world. Fight with your fists. Enter your name in its maker.
about Billy, the quiet kid sailing at sea. One morning while fishing, the sky suddenly turns to gray, and all the colors fade away. I love a person who respects the classics, and we have Zalve Nelson Jr., director on El Paso Elsewhere, rocking a Toe Jam and Earl's t shirt. Hi, Ian Zalve. Tell us about your t shirt. The uh, developer of Toe Jam and Earl gave it to me. Uh, I had the fortune of meeting him. He was like, Do you want a t shirt? I was like, Absolutely. Uh, and now this is、uh, one of the most treasured things that I put on my body. All right, all right, Zalave. We're not here to flex. We're here to talk about your new game,、uh, El Paso Elsewhere, which is <laughs> itself a flex. Yeah, which is a huge flex. Like I'm making a game, and I've got a Told You I'm an Elsewhere T-shirt. Wow, living the great life. So you you are from Strange Scaffold, a really cool little、uh, studio, and you've made a bunch of exciting games. But the one we're talking about today is El Paso Elsewhere, which It basically sold me on it the moment I read the the description, which was supernatural neo noir third person shooter. I was like, I know exactly what that means, but there might be some people out there who are like, what the hell does that even mean? So tell us, what does that mean? What is El Paso Elsewhere? It is a spiritual successor and evolution to、uh, classic shooters like Dead to Rights, Max Payne, and.、Uh, Anything that goes bump in the dark, really. We're taking、uh, noir conventions and that genre, and this very kinetic, physical way of interacting with the world in slow mo, and applying that to a nuanced story of monsters and love, and of、uh, fighting your way through hell, floor by bloody floor. Awesome. What other games are out there? Whether it's AAA or India, you looking to beyond, you know, the obvious inspirations like Max Payne, as as things that are inspir- inspirational to you when you're making this game.、Uh, unexpected influence is the Die Hard trilogy for PS1.、Uh, I love that game. I love that game. That's why we're set to motel, and that's why you're <laughs> fighting in this bloody, darkened void. Not to get too personal, but. A huge piece of this project comes from the idea and, and the fact that you can be anything in black these days, or at least that's what you're told. You can be president, you can be an astronaut, you can be a game developer. The one thing you can't be is black and angry. That's terrifying. That will terrify supportive white people. Being black and angry. 
being black and justifiably raging against a world that itself is destroying not just people who look like you, not just your family, but also anything that doesn't fit into this very precise mold of how you are supposed to behave. So, uh, long story short, we're making an original hip hop soundtrack, uh, including such lyrics as terrorism is easy, be black in public, because there is nothing that more clearly expresses, um, fighting through hell for by bloody floor than some good old fashioned hip hop. Oh yeah. So I'm hoping that through the gameplay, through the narrative and through our audio layers, we are delivering the same sense of freedom of expression and uh, critically feeling badass, even if you're just sitting in your room in your underwear. Yeah, it's, it's that feeling of it's that feeling of knowing you you can be yourself and be okay because i remember having that same feeling where i was like i don't have to keep up with pop music just to fit in i can just listen to rap if if that's the only thing i want to do and i remember i had that kind of uh realization around the same time until the end of time came out um tupac shakur's uh kind of album and i just blasted the sh out of that album and it was one of the best like months of my life i was just to say it's we're talking to people who don't understand that like a music a song like the police isn't like hey we're going to jack up the police it is an expression of i cannot do anything against this overwhelming fascist force yeah but yeah. i can rap and you're going to hear every amount of this, the, this, this, this justified fury and rage expressed uh, through music. Zalavea, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to talk to us about El Paso elsewhere. Hopefully we get to see more of it very, very soon. You know, as a big fan of the classic Max Payne, I am definitely interested in Zalavera's team take on the genre. Next up, though, we have a developer that hails from the Philippines developing a tasty game for your senses. You know, every time I see a game that has to do with food in 4K, it makes me want to grab my phone and hit that DoorDash button to hop right in. But let's jump into some more trailers, and Tam will interview Chikan with Soup Pot in our next developer interview. Here is a world premiere. In the past, I worked on series and political games like Headliner about fake news and its effect on society. Following those topics has been very draining, both mentally and emotionally. I really needed a break, something that would be silly, colorful and gameplay focused. Hi, my name is Yaku and I would like to tell you about our game. <coughs> what the? What's a better idea than a game where you play as a little cloud and ruin everybody's day? Limiting our protagonist to being a cloud was an interesting design challenge that actually spurred a lot of innovation. Sure, we can rely on weather powers like rain, snow or tornado. What about different rain modes? What if you could rain acid rain and corrode vehicles? What about raining oil and propagating fire? What about raining coffee into mugs of tired office workers? And then we realized, why limit ourselves to liquids? Why not rain bread that attracts pigeons or hens that can pet dogs? Why not rain swords and go on an epic adventure, solving quests and exploring dungeons? What if other games got invaded by the cloud? What if you were sneaking through a compound a la Metal Gear Solid? Or maybe Silent Hill, but you're the monster. Forcing ourselves to be a cloud give birth to many unusual, if hilarious ways of subverting player expectations. Always expect the unexpected. Rain in your parade is out now. I 
remember what I can. Sometimes it's difficult. But when I do remember, <laughs> I remember everything. The, the colors, the, the sounds, oh, the words. Words are how I collect my memories. They are what tell me I'm still me. I must hold them close. Before it's too late. Cooking is a comforting outlet for a lot of people and Filipino studio Chicon Club wants to give you the same warm and fuzzy feelings from their new game, Soup Pot. I'm joined by Gwen Foster, who is requested to be called Penguin Master, but is actually a technical director. How are you doing, Gwen? I'm doing great. Thank you for indulging me in, in that request. <laughs> I like it. I'm always up for a bit of shenanigans, so I super, super appreciate you doing that. Um, so, my first question for you, Gwen, is um, tell us about tell us about Soup Pot. What is it, and why should people be interested in it? Uh, so, one of the things that uh, the team itself like really wanted to do. So, originally it was just Trina and me, uh, who is the art director of the game. Uh, we wanted a cooking game that's just really focused on cooking. So you have games that like overcook, but it's more of management of the kitchen, which is still super fun. Uh, you have games like Monster Hunter that feature cooking, but it's more animation. But there are very few games, um, Cooking Simulator is one of them, that are actually focused on cooking itself. So we wanted to recreate that, but the gist is that where we grew up, 
we actually don't do recipes <laughs> and so like it's more of like heart or feelings or you know the the voices of your ancestors and we wanted to have that in the game so we actually released a demo last year and people really liked it so we we made it a bigger game which is super fun obviously Supot is coming from a team in Southeast Asia where not a lot of games come from and that means that you have a distinct perspective. How much of the how much in terms of when you're creating the game are you thinking about hey this is an opportunity for us to not only put a real cool game out but also educate people around the world about our culture and I know I for one don't have a lot of exposure to Filipino food and like now I see this not only as a a game that I want to play but also as an educational experience how do you, how much do you keep that in mind the thing is that uh and this might sound corny is that you know when you're making something of course start with what you know so definitely like we wanted to do a cooking game but we wanted but you know of course like if we go ahead and do like Italian cooking we're not going to be qualified to do that uh and so it it's a uh, it's a good coincidence in a way because like we we just generally want like more of our food uh, to enjoy and the thing is that with food the more like we delve into it and because like we have DLCs planned that would touch on different cultures uh, the more we realize that there's just so many similarities across the regions that it's really about ingredients and then like how you do things. What do you think? needs to be done or what needs to happen for a region like Southeast Asia to become some kind of powerhouse in its own right where people don't feel compelled to work for companies that are from other countries but do what you do and put together a stronger presence in the region how how what does the development community need to do and what does the people outside of that people who buy and play games need to do to support that I think one of the things that um hopefully doesn't get me cancelled is that because we are from this part of region of the world there is that like oh this game isn't worth this much money and then developers also you know fall to prey that like because this is the notion of games like this that we are of lesser quality like even though we're just as talented that they price their games too low and then which you know like to a consumer also thinks it's like oh this is too cheap like maybe it's not worth my money um so that's one thing like both from the consumer and players uh developers perspective like in terms of business you see so many innovative games come out and like kinder uh and just more fun games coming from the west that people in southeast asia or any other region that doesn't have the similar access. They do also have those ideas, but they're not exposed to funding opportunities. They're not exposed to the right people. And Twitter does help, but at the same time, uh, you just, you know, you have to have a strong heart and a thick skin <laughs> to to like mm. get to a point where, you know, you you feel like you deserve it that that hey you know I, that's basically what happened to us is that hey there are no games that don't have recipes <laughs> that literally you know have a cooking game that has no recipes or it's just like hey here are ingredients do whatever you want um but but yeah the i think that's that's mainly the thing that you know people the developers themselves have to feel like they deserve it and at the same time they just have to make a really great game that Hopefully, if you know luck falls on them, is something that everybody will get to love and enjoy to play. So yeah, there's there's opportunities to support developers in these regions, and it doesn't mean getting something that's alien to you. It means getting something that's fresh and unique, and in a lot of cases, something that you already know, but coming from a new angle, which is always good. Thank you, thank you. Also, like this, this is super fun, and thank you, thank you for. Uh, giving us this platform and giving us this opportunity. All hail the Penguin Master. Thank you. 
Now I'm extremely hungry for some hot pot, some pho, some ramen, some chicken noodle soup, I don't even know. We have another set of sweet game trailers and reveals for you to sink your teeth into. And then we'll be talking to the dev team behind the classic RPG inspired artistic fever dream, She Dreams Elsewhere from Davion Gooden and Studio Severe. Check out the trailers and we will be right back. Welcome to Lahaina, a wonder of endless beauty and nature. Let your troubles melt away on this tropical paradise. Relax your mind and soul on one of our breathtaking beaches, or stimulate your adventurous side with exciting activities found all over the island. The Aloha Spirit will leave its mark on you and keep you coming again and again. Get ready for an unforgettable experience that is sure to bring you peace, serenity, and plenty of magical memories. Lahaina, the destination of a lifetime. I will now gauge your interest in multiplayer by simulating a multiplayer experience. I am helping. We are doing this together. We are friends. I'm this we are people bought by doing activity. Oh. I'm Gwen Frey, and this is Labrat. Good. You have unlocked a new puzzle. Begin the next puzzle. Good work. Here is your achievement. You are a tester. Your job is to evaluate a puzzle game that is being crafted by this artificial intelligence. I am giving you control of your very own gun. Please be responsible. Unfortunately, the AI has gained access to more data than we anticipated, and it seems to be generating new games based on whatever it finds. The place where you live is dark and full of crimes. What are we going to do? There are so many guns. You have nothing on me. For updates on the game's progress, you can follow me on Twitter. And you can support us by wishlisting Labrat on Steam, or by signing up for the closed beta at labrat.study. Thank you. Welcome to Palm Mall. We're proud to welcome you to your home away from home. Grab some friends and head down to Watersons, where you can shop till you drop with the best deals in town. Visit the world famous Paradise Cinema, featuring wall to wall screens and unparalleled sound and have a blast with the whole family at Luna Dreamland, featuring our newest, most wildest attraction, the Hall of Mirrors. Our courteous staff is here to serve you at all times. After all, only the best for our guests. So much variety, so much style. What are you waiting for? 
We can't wait for you to come visit us. Palm Mall, a place to relax, a place to explore, a place to dream. Uh, indie games are incredibly powerful because they often tackle themes, topics, and issues that are deeply human, but often sidelined by a lot of the major big budget titles. She Dreams Elsewhere is one of those indie games and is being made by one incredibly talented person, Davion Gooden, designer, director, writer, and pretty much everything else. Davion, thank you for joining. How are you doing? Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, you know, the world's still kind of on fire, but other than that, you know, I'm vibing. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> you know what? We will get to the world on fire bit because there's an interesting part of your development that I kind of want to check out. But first, like, tell us about She Dreams Elsewhere. What is it and what do you want to explore with it? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, She Dreams Elsewhere, it's a surreal adventure RPG about dreams, nightmares, and all types of self-identity fun stuff. Uh, you're playing as a woman named Dahlia and you're in a coma. You got to figure out like how you got in a coma, find a way to wake up, confront your know, inner nightmares and just have like this horrible trippy experience the entire way. Um, so yeah, overall, it's a game about how it's like OK to not be OK and like just, you know, to reach out to other people like because you, know, you never know what they're going through. Um, and, you know, all the other fun existential stuff like that. One of my first questions with with this game was seeing it was all you doing this alone um and also seeing that it's something that hits on like really personal themes and we've seen a fair few like one person development teams like that handles heavy subject matter like you know undertale is an easy one to grab but what's that process like making a game on your own but also for want of a better phrase putting your pains into that game or your kind of like learnings into that game what's what's that like and what are the challenges day to day that people might not know because they just see a game that looks cool and it's like oh one person development team what is the true human cost of a one person development team it's it's a blessing and a curse because on one hand like I, i've pretty much been able to do exactly what i wanted to do with this game um and i'm like a weird guy with like a lot of like weird ideas um, so let's just kind of like do that, like unfiltered and just like do me where normally in like a bigger development team, it'd be like, you know, it had to like pass like, you know, X amount of approvals, get past the marketing department, you know, all this stuff. Um, so having that freedom has been like super liberating. It's a little lonely sometimes, um, mm -hmm. but it is fun. And I would, I, there's very few things I'd rather want to be doing right now. Um, so I'm very thankful for it, but also I'm very, very tired. <laughs> So you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, you enjoy having the kind of autonomy to make the thing your own, but the, the support is really kind of tricky thing. Do you think um, we're getting to a stage where developing indie games is is being supported by, you know, bigger publishers in a more meaningful way? You know, we have the Xbox is going out there to find smaller developers and, and PlayStation and that. Do you think that is getting better? And how do you think it could improve the games industry could improve and support creators with unique voices so that there's more perspectives around. I, th I definitely do think it's getting better. Like even just the support that like I've gotten from, you know, big platforms like Xbox, uh, Sony, or not, not Sony, uh, Nintendo, um, you know, all these like other platforms that are just like actually reaching out for like opportunities and just like, you know, just stuff, just to support what I'm doing. That's like dope. And I don't think you would have like seen that, especially for a game like this, like even like five, 10 years ago. Um, so that's a really big set. With that being said, we still got a hell of a lot of work to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that really comes down to like, who is like working in the industry? Uh, who are like the gatekeepers of like this industry? And like, yeah, like who is like funding these projects? Who is like getting these like, you know, deals like signed? Um, and it's a matter of like actually like, you know, going out and like actively doing the work and like reaching out uh, to like a more like diverse, um, like just creative support. A creative squad actually going out and like putting your money where your mouth is and like just funding like actual projects like not even in like the tens of like thousands but i'm talking like millions you know like why why isn't there like a cow nights fun that like xbox has which is like funding like triple a games like made by like diverse teams um i know it's like happening in the background but like we could do a lot better i think um 
and it's crazy because like even like developers uh, who are like they might have like a few more people than me but like you know we're still kind of doing the same thing we're like the same age like same experience level like they're still having like trouble like getting money so it's like what is happening here i don't know yeah, video there's, games are there's, weird. there's definitely room for um major publishers and platform holders being louder about doing it because and, and giving people avenues about you know reaching out to put people put themselves forward because i feel like yeah it's happening in the background but it shouldn't be in the background it should be in the foreground so that people who may have these ambitions know that there is a path there right there's like all, almost like there's gatekeeping by not talking about it enough um, right, and we should be in a in a in a industry that is open about it and welcomes it. Um, but yeah, it's it's. In, I hope that we get to a stage where that is possible, and hopefully, games like She Dreams Elsewhere does kind of help push that that kind of path forward. Uh, <laughs> Davion, thank you so much for taking the time out of your incredibly busy day to uh, talk to us about She Dreams Elsewhere. Davion's development journey with She Dreams Elsewhere is is really fascinating. He was a part of the Mix's Black Voices in Gaming freshman class, which was super awesome. I'm looking forward to the release. Next up, we have another set of trailers and Tam will be heating it up with another spicy interview with Spanish developer Severio and co-founder of Troglobites, who will share his team's game, Ido no Yami, Blind Fate. Let's get it. Chinatown Detective Agency. <laughs> Where do I even start? Well, it's a vibrant, neon-lit point-and-click adventure game set in a future Singapore in the year 2032. It's a dark world inspired by hard-boiled detective films, comics, and novels. But out of all of our sources of inspiration, one towers above all. The classic Where in the World is Carmen Sandiego games of the late 80s and 90s. And these were the games that inspired Chinatown's most important gameplay mechanic. Real research. As you play the role of Amira Dharma, an ex-cop and Interpol officer, 
you'll encounter cases with puzzles that will require you to literally look beyond the game for answers. That's right. You're going to have to consult Google to find the answers to the puzzles that cover a range of topics in history, art, science, and cryptography. These cases will also see you traveling the world to exotic locations in search of the next lead or to track down a person of interest. In essence, it's a game that asks you to be a real detective. We hope you'll join Amira as she unravels conspiracies and infiltrates criminal syndicates amid a backdrop of a chaotic world hanging on by a thread. Chinatown Detective Agency comes out later this year on PC, via Steam, and a few other storefronts, and on Nintendo Switch. It is my great pleasure to be joined by the CEO of Troglobites Games, Saverio Caprosho, and we're going to be talking about Blind Fate Edo no Yami, a super exciting anime-inspired action game that I love the look of. Saverio, how are you doing today? Hi, Tamora. I'm fine. Hello, everybody. How are you? <laughs> doing good. Thank you so much. So, Edo no Yami, tell us a little bit about it. Blind Fate Edo no Yami, I should say the full name. Tell us a little bit about it. Where did the idea for it come from? It looks super cool. Uh... Yes, thank you. The, um, the idea of the game comes, uh, of course, by something innovative that we want to apply in the world of, uh, of the video games. Basically, the, the main character is uh, blind, so you cannot see the environment. At the same time, it's also a cyborg, um, meaning that he can receive handled data. And with the, the, user, the help of this data and of the sensors, he can perceive the environment so you can navigate through the level. And we thought that this kind of uh, combination is a really cool idea and will be welcomed by the public. Yeah, that's a really cool intersection of two kind of concepts. How does it actually manifest in the video game? You talked about one character, the character being blind and then receiving data. Um, can you break it down a little more so people who might not be able, might not, might not understand how that comes together can kind of get a grasp of how the game plays? Yes, there are. Uh, yes, indeed, there are uh, some other concepts. Um, he receives uh, data in his brain about the environment. Okay, so he sees the environment like, uh, uh, let's say, um, Google Map. So you see everything, but those data are old. They are from the past because it was an apocalypse. Due to the narrative, there was an apocalypse. So now, the, for instance, the environment has changed after so many years. So yes, you can trust the data that you have, but you cannot trust totally because you know there is a bridge, and then this bridge has collapsed. Collapsed. It does not uh, does no longer exist. So you have to retrieve new data, and guess who has those uh, new data? The enemies. So you have to kill key enemies. Uh, they are machines. They have eyes. <laughs> they record everything. You have to steal the data from the enemies so you can uh, see the world, how actually it looks like. 
So one thing I really love to look up is the action. Can you talk a bit about the inspirations and where you kind of are looking to in terms of other games or other forms of media in putting together the action at the core of Ed on Yami? Yes, I mean, we took uh, inspiration both from movies, actually, and uh, games. I mean, the movie, a movie about uh, um, a blind uh, samurai is uh, Zatoichi and uh, Blind Fury, if you, <laughs> if you remember <laughs> those, uh, those movies. And okay, the settings, you know, the futuristic settings, let's say, recalls a bit, a bit, let's say, just to say, uh, Strider and uh, all the other games like uh, like the Ninja Guide and other games that we loved when uh, in our childhood. So of know. course we yeah. meet together. And there's also one more mechanic to do with sensing and sensors and smell and that kind of stuff. Um, it sounded really fascinating when I was learning about it. Can you tell me about it? Uh, yes, sure. Uh, being uh, blind, of course, you, you see the environment, but you don't see the, um, the the things are moving on and what is inside for instance something is hidden so you have three sensors the hearing sensor the heat sensor and the smell olfactory sensor so you can see the stimulus that are produced by the enemies or by the environment now if the enemy is approaching you you will uh, see the ripple of the sound of the steps of the enemy so you will see the enemy is approaching you can uh, react uh, if you are stuck in a room, you can use uh, the other sensor to find a way out. So yes, the mechanic of the sensor helps you to navigate through the level and to fight. It's uh, also a component to fight the enemies. For for a developer that is kind of smaller but and, and has this kind of big vision in the same way that a team like yours has for Blind Fate, what would you say, what piece of advice would you give them to Take the, take the risk or take the shot at their dream and make a game that they want to, even if they do feel that they might have some hurdles because they are smaller developers. How would you empower those kind of indie developers? Um, what would you say to them? So, yeah, first of all, they, in my opinion, they should um, learn how to work together during uh, some, uh, some jams. There are many. Uh, participate, try to participate to any jams. Then you will see which concept you can work better, which is your uh, reach in terms of cost, time, and production. And then once you have, uh, you have, a, let's say, product you can uh, you want to work with. Well, in this moment you can start approaching, if needed, uh, a publisher and uh, yeah, to, to support your your vision, as you say. <laughs> so let's say start from from uh, very very small things. Mm. Uh, we did uh, if, if if I can we did uh, we start with our first first game is Hyper Parasite and then we moved a bit forward in the world of the indie just because of course because we were known among um, we, we we launched the game so we were able to to collaborate with one one XP for this uh, game with a bit uh, bigger ambition. That's awesome. So stick together baby steps and you two can make a game inspired by Zatoichi and Strider that looks pretty awesome. <laughs> thank you. Saverio, so, thank you so much for your time. Super excited to, to see more of the game and check it out ourselves. Thank you so much. Definitely my type of game. I want to grab my samurai sword, do a double backflip and slice foes in half. With our final interview, we will travel to Japan to the hot springs with our friend Derek Fields, co-founder of Waking Oni Games, to talk about his soon-to-be-released game, Onsen Master. But first, some more slick trailers and upcoming releases. Don't you think? It's time to release the Quacken!
big for someone so small. You need to be taught some respect. So let me enlighten you. a time where everyone is dreaming of relaxing in an onsen Derek Fields founder and director of Working Oni wants you to manage one Derek what's going on here it all centered on being a cozy game centered on um you know connectivity and and bringing people together uh it on semester was deeply inspired by uh, a love for um family films especially ghibli films and i'm sure i'm sure saying that out loud for some viewers they might be able to catch some hints on what keenly influenced a game like managing a hot spring um spirited away is a, a film that's very near and dear to myself my family and it's something that brought us together on the couch and in the theaters anytime those were were brought to our city and uh, it, it it stuck around with me wanting to create a game that could center on those same things what would it be like to uh, manage a hot spring to manage various uh, spirits called yokai and the, the different humans that are also visiting your your onsen. All right. So you mentioned a bunch of inspirations for um, Onsen Master earlier, and it sounds like it comes from a bunch of different you know, people and, and perspectives uh, being involved in the studio and the game. So you you kind of you've described yourself as a BIPOC studio. Can you talk a little bit about what that means and also what impact that has on Onsen Master as you create it? One of the things that I didn't necessarily have growing up were games that included characters that were that were black and brown. It was always interacting with a protagonist that didn't necessarily look like me. And so I would love to add into the games that are now being represented in media that do have people that look like us um, and be a part of that space. Do you think we're getting better? And do you think it's kind of being led by the industry, indies in the industry? Um, yes and yes. I think things are absolutely getting better. I think there are certainly more games out there that are including people that look like, um, like that look like each of us having this conversation now. Um, I think absolutely indie games are championing this inclusion and this representation that needs to be seen um, across the industry as a whole. And because of that, there are certainly more kind of AAA level games that are including more uh, BIPOC characters um, and some very notable games too. And so I hope, <laughs> I, I, you know, uh, optimistic me, I, I don't want that to stop. I want to see more. I want, um, I, I want just it to continue happening. Hmm. As, as people, I know we said that it's getting better, but it feels like there's, is there a ways for us to signal to the broader games industry maybe even the triple a industry to be like hey we really want this um and really break through in a big way um do you think that's how do we do that do we just support 
um, indie developers or do we I mean should indie, an indie developer out there who may be thinking about making a game just take the jump and you know do that thing that they think that it might be a risk yeah um, you know when I think of that conversation there are uh, maybe a, a two or three components that come to mind um, one is the support uh, first and foremost and um, ensuring that we are uplifting other developers who are building uh, games and narratives that um, continue to add to the space of, of including BIPOC characters and, and that also extends to LGBTQIA plus characters as well and, and individuals within those games. Um, it sends a signal. It sends a signal on social media when you start seeing um, certain stories being talked about in um, how impactful they are for the community uh, to see themselves represented. Um, I'm, I'm not alone in experiencing Miles Morales Spider-Man and mm. uh, how impactful having that sort of representation through and throughout uh, not only the story but the communities that um, Miles played in uh, throughout that narrative. And that's, that, that's an example when you see resounding feedback from Twitter and so on, it, it's important. I think for the other component, uh, you know, next to uplifting is ensuring that we can provide resources to indie developers who are pursuant of that same endeavor. Uh, because a lot of the times people who come from these backgrounds are marginalized and therefore don't have the same access to resources in order to produce these ideas. There is a very, very real cause and effect. So yeah, supporting games where, you know, there are BIPOC, LGBTQIA plus, um, characters is super important thank you so much for your time derek i think we could talk about this all day long but absolutely i'm sure you've got a game about making people manage on <laughs> i'll let you get back to that but thank you so much those are just some of the awesome games being created by developers around the world we had everything from drink cans fighting each other to an action game with a duck to a soothing town building simulator and that's just a small selection of the amazing experiences that inclusive indie game developers are making around the world before we head off i just want to give a huge thank you to all the indie developers and the publishers working with them who took the time and effort to create trailers for us and then talk to us and i also want to thank everyone at game GameSpot and The Mix for working so hard over the past few weeks to put this amazing showcase together. Thank you so much. Yeah, Tam, I mean, it's so many great games uh, and, and developers that we shared today, um, exclusive and inclusive at the same time, which is great. The interviews were amazing. Thank you all for joining us. Thank GameSpot for showcasing these games. It means a lot to the developers. Of course, I'm also a developer myself. Um, again, my name is Justin Woodward from the Media Indie Exchange, The Mix at Indie Exchange, and we will catch you later. Peace.